we've got uh, scripture reading and prayer. So Jean-Luc, you want to take it away? Proverbs chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given unto you. James chapter 3, verse 17. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. On humility, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Let's take this opportunity to pray to our Heavenly Father. Dear Lord God, thank for today. Thank you that we have all these people coming together just to learn more about you through science as your creative medium, Lord. And Lord, as, as I pray that as we get into this topic of humility, of wisdom, Lord, I pray that we will not just understand what does it mean of, you know, what people may commonly coin as earthly wisdom or earthly humility, but I pray that we'll be we'll gain this understanding and strive for what is considered as heavenly wisdom, as heavenly humility, Lord, something that you desire and will ultimately glorify you. Lord, I pray that throughout this teaching as well, or throughout this conference, that much fruit bear and that people learn what it means to not lean on, lean on our own understanding, but to lean on your wisdom, Lord. Thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay. Come on up. We've got Mike Mobley and uh, Karen Denzler from Grand Canyon University, uh, along with uh, Andrew Briggs, uh, who has been a personal encouragement to me over many years. So it's so, such a wonderful uh, opportunity to have these wonderful people on stage. Thank you, John Luke, for those, uh, those uh, scripture readings. Uh, I think you stole a lot of our thunder. Now we can go home. The wisdom from Scripture probably covered it pretty well. <laughs> but uh, we're going to try and be fairly quick through this uh, significant amount of material that we want to cover with you uh, today. First, I'm going to do some introductions. Uh, I'm Mike Mobley. I'm the executive director for the Office for Research and Innovation at Grand Canyon University. I'm a physical chemist, and I continue to do research in the areas of optical diffraction and the nature of light. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Karen Densler. She's associate professor of biology at Grand Canyon University, uh, teaching microbiology, molecular, and cellular bi biology and genetics, and that's her area of research as well. And then uh, to, uh, to my right is Professor Andrew Briggs. Uh, he's also a physicist, chemist, well, I should say solid state uh, chemistry. Get close to it. That'll do. Very, very homogenized. Uh, he's the inaugural holder of the Chair of Nanomaterials at the University of Oxford, and his research interests uh, focus on nanomaterials for quantum technologies and their incorporation into um, practical devices. I strongly encourage you to look at the bios that are listed with the, with the program, because I, I can't do them justice right now. Um, Starting off, our discussion uh, will be uh, on science and wisdom, and we want this to be brought into focus by looking at the recent book by Professor Briggs and his good friend Michael Rice, uh, Human Flourishing, Scientific Insights, Spiritual Wisdom in Uncertain Times. And I've got a copy of the book, and all the yellow sticky notes indicates how thoroughly I've read it and marked it up. And these are available if you'd like to purchase one and have uh, 
Dr. Briggs uh, sign it uh, later on. Um, but I do want to give my, shall we say, back of the panel uh, endorsement of the book. Um, it's a very comprehensive review of the historical views of human flourishing. But it's a lot more, uh, um, more than a philosophy textbook. It really is a textbook for the philosophy of life. And you will gain a lot of insight and wisdom from, from the book and how we, how we should be acting as Christians. Um, the uh, book collates many rich citations. Uh, um, one of my favorites is from a contemporary philosopher, Woody Allen, who pointed out, if you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. And um, one of the uh, citations that is in the book um, is in actually a graph form, and I think we can have that up here. Yeah, thank you. It's from page uh, 317. Um, it's an intriguing figure that shows that in 2020, about 85% of our new college students just entering college cite as an important thing in their life is being well off financially. Um, and this goal is compared to 40% in 1970, whereas almost in contrast, uh, developing a meaningful philosophy of life dropped to 50% uh, from 70% in 1970. Uh, to me, this was a concerning change, and it actually speaks to the clear importance and timeliness of the book that we're going to be talking about today. Um, many of you have not yet read the book, so I'm going to ask uh, Professor Briggs to please just share with us about 10 minutes of an overview of the uh, key elements of the book. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and, and what an amazing conference this is. It's, it's wonderful to be here with such wonderful people and so many important issues being raised. This uh, graph here that Mike uh, introduced you to shows what people were thinking about at the start of their college studies. And it's interesting to contrast that with what people care about towards the end of their careers. So the next uh, slide that I'm going to show you is the list of the, uh, uh, well, from 1,500 people surveyed. What were their greatest regrets looking back on their life? And you'll see that the first three are all about relationships, not about money at all. And in fact, none of those, well, they scarcely relate to money, those regrets. So there's this contrast between what people think at the start of their studies is going to be important to them, and what people towards the end of their careers, looking back, reckon was in fact important, uh, and, and what their regrets are from not having paid enough attention to the promotion of human flourishing for themselves and those they care for. So we, uh, in trying to describe what human flourishing is, we identify three dimensions. And the first of them is material, because it's hard to flourish if you're living in extreme poverty. Paul Collier's bottom billion uh, by, uh, you know, 2020 had all but vanished in East Asia and the Pacific. And they're predicted to vanish, essentially, by 2030 in South Asia. But the prospects for Africa are not so good. The second dimension that we identify is uh, relational, because it's not good for individuals to be alone. Solitary confinement is a terrible punishment. And because we need people, and we've evolved to need people, uh, that's why marriage is actually rather a good forecaster of happiness. So, whoops. Oh, sorry, this, this, this is just uh, to show you on the, on the um, financial side, that once you've got a certain baseline of wealth, the greatest predictor of um, health and social problems is um, not income, but income inequality. And the greater the income inequality, the worse are the health and social problems. 
And I'm sorry to say, if you look there, that uh, dot right at the top, towards the right, is the USA. Uh, this is some um, statistics of um, the percentage who are very happy among married and never married Americans. So the, the marriage is a very good predictor. Of course, it's only that. This, these are statistics, and we all know people who are unmarried who uh, seem to be very happy and certainly contribute very much to human flourishing. And then the third dimension that we identify is something different from both material and relational. We call it transcendent because this material world that we live in and even the best of the relationships that we enjoy seem to call out for something beyond themselves. William Wordsworth put it like this, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns. And this transcendent uh, dimension is something that, that uh, I find can be recognized and identified with people um, of all sorts of different backgrounds and religious commitments. In that sense, it's a wonderful contact point for uh, engaging uh, across, as it were, the belief divide. Human flourishing is not suspended in midair with no visible means of support. And we identified three pillars of human flourishing which have a marvelous resonance with the sort of things that were being discussed in the first uh, session this morning. The first is truth. I love this graph. This is uh, a result of a survey as to who's trustworthy. I like it because the scientists come top with the longest green bars. Um, I, uh, at the bottom are government ministers and politicians, and I do assure you this was taken before the uh, recent shenanigans in the UK and others that you might be able to identify elsewhere in the world. The second one is purpose. And what we found with all three of these pillars is there's a surprising amount of, well, a complex entanglement between, as it were, objective reality and uh, individual responsibility and engagement. And uh, to some extent, that comes as a surprise to people when we're talking about truth. You're entitled to your own opinions, but not to your own facts. And yet, in ways that we might uh, elaborate in discussion, uh, how we choose to look, what intellectual instruments we choose to do the looking, what questions we choose to ask, what's important to us, will affect how we describe truth. And with Purpose. Also, I understand what people mean when they look for purpose. Yes, this evening we had a, a wonderful dialogue which included Paul Davis, who will talk about the purpose of the universe. And I understand what he means by that. We have rich discussions about it. And yet, and I, I, and I love it when, uh, you know, people early in their careers um, say, I want to find the purpose of my life. And I understand what they mean by that, but there's also an element of choice in purpose, and actually, to some extent, a, an element of creating purpose. And then the third um, pillar that we identify is meaning. This is a painting by Roger Wagner, who some of you have read a book we wrote together called uh, The Penultimate Curiosity. Roger loves to take a story from the literature and bring into it modern technology to prompt people to find meaning in the contemporary technological age in which we live. But that meaning has to be related not only to the intention of, in this case, the painter, but also the engagement of the viewer. And then in the book, in part three, so part one is the dimensions of human flourishing. Part two is the pillars of human flourishing. Part three, we try to apply these principles to areas where we see things are changing very fast. Uh, the first one is in the economic and social sciences, where old sort of certainties of economic forecasting are being replaced by what John Kay and Mervyn King 
describe as radical uncertainty. And the old model from microeconomics of homo economicus as rational, greedy, selfish, lazy uh, man, for once you may be glad it's only man in this case, um, is being replaced by a much richer understanding. It's not that humans never act like that, but you're mistaken if you think they only act like that. Uh, and so it's being replaced by what I call homo fidelis, um, intuitive, generous, altruistic, energetic woman and man. And uh, you're beginning to see this reflected in corporate values. I've just uh, spun out a company last year from the University of Oxford using machine learning for quantum technologies. And uh, the first two things we did in founding the company were the cap table and the statement of the company values. And the old company value of uh, shareholder values comes fourth in the list after promoting human flourishing, respecting individual dignity, and dealing ethically with everyone. The second area is the area of uh, changing patterns of religious commitment. Um, it comes as a surprise to some people that uh, data like these from the Pew Foundation show that in many countries of the world, well over half the population say that uh, religion is very important to them. Um, in my own uh, tradition of Anglicanism, people are beginning to uh, replace talk of a post-Christian Europe with talk of a post-European Christianity. And in the case of Anglicanism, the fastest growth is occurring in Africa. And this matters because um, it affects uh, attitudes to science and technology. So the left-hand side is uh, data from the Welcome Global Monitor, 140 countries, over 1,000 people interviewed in each country. And it's the percentage of the whole population who say science disagrees with their religion, uh, uh, with countries getting up to 72% of the population saying that, including, I'm sorry to say, the United States of America. And then on the right-hand side, you've got the percentage of the whole population going up to 96% in some countries who say they'd choose their religion over science where they perceive them in conflict. So that has to be addressed by scientists of faith, those of us who um, pursue science professionally and wanted to engage with our religion, and indeed, in my case, would say that uh, I do not perceive there to be any conflict, which is not to say there aren't some hard questions to address and work at. Uh, this is changing. Um, these are the changes in the last two years, as judged by the Welcome Global Monitor. And you can see that the changes are quite big, and they go in both directions. And then the uh, third case study that we look at is human flourishing in an age of technology. And we identified two particular areas, um, machine learning and, uh, uh, and gene synthesis, and then a teensy bit on COVID, which came just as we were finishing the book. This is uh, reports from a. Uh, uh, this is some conclusions from a report that came out last week in the UK on the effect of social media on the uh, well-being and flourishing of young people. And uh, the answer is, in many cases, it was linked to negative well-being and self-esteem. With I'm sorry to say, the girls particularly badly uh, affected. One in three girls unhappy with their personal appearance by the age of 14. Young people with probable mental illness has risen from one in nine to one in six. And boys at the bottom set of primary school had lower self-esteem at 14 than, than, than their peers. So there are these um, very damaging effects of the digital technologies that need to be addressed. and. Uh, I hope you realize that by now the digital technologies are absolutely inseparable from the machine learning which powers them. But I don't want it to be seen as all negative. You know, there's the uh, observation from the ancient wit wisdom that the technology of metallurgy can be applied both to swords and to plowshares. And in my laboratory, 
uh, we're using machine learning greatly to accelerate the science we can do. And you could multiply those examples, particularly in healthcare, uh, and in many other areas too. So, so the machine learning has got fantastic potential for good, as indeed has, has um, uh, you know, gene, well, gene repair, gene editing, but, but in the future, gene synthesis as well. And however different these technologies are, the deeper you go, the more you're asking the question, what are humans for? What do we want humans to be like? How do we want to support human flourishing? What would that mean? And how would we do it? This is just a sort of cuddly version of uh, robotics. I hope by the time you know that I'm losing my faculties, there'll be robots to make me a cup of tea and come and help me with things. We conclude the book by imagining love as a sort of fuel for human flourishing. As a teenager, I came across a description of love. I, I heard about it. Uh, I went back home, I, I thumbed through my Bible and eventually found where it was. It was written by an international activist and speaker and writer, and it stuck with me all my life. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And our vision for the book is um, love like that, promoting and energizing human flourishing through the best of scientific insight and spiritual wisdom. Thank you, Andrew. We're going to unpack that a little bit more in a panel discussion here. Um, and as I said, we're going to turn this into a panel discussion right now. And I'm going to start by engaging Dr. Densler and just asking uh, you, Karen, how would you connect your interests as a scientist with your Christian faith and with the whole idea of connecting science and wisdom? You. Okay, yes, I'd love to answer that. So um, it seems that we all start in science uh, with an interest. So if you are an undergrad or um, high school even, um, you're probably very interested in something in science. I was interested in the biological sciences. And um, as I went on uh, studying into graduate school and postgrad, realized when I had a technology that I was working with, um, we, we wanted to use it toward a purpose and something that could uh, benefit people. And so in my area, I was looking at, you know, therapeutics for viral infections or right now bacterial infections. And those are things that could definitely benefit people's health. So there are things as we learn, whatever field we're in, that can definitely benefit and help people flourish or do better um, in life. At the same time, um, I got to know people, maybe as uh, groups of students that I was talking with, and um, I could actually promote the knowledge of God's love um, to them as I teach uh, what God has created and what God has put together. And uh, often as I work, whether it was in a laboratory training someone or you know a student who's learning a technique, uh, I find we end up with a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with people time where we get to know an individual, find out who they are, uh, where they want to go and encourage them on their path. So, you know, as a scientist, maybe as a teacher, um, to build them up, uh, to again, show the value that they have that is God given, um, and just to help direct them as they, they follow their path in science. Thanks, Karen. I'm going to do a follow up with you here. And uh, Jean Luc, provided two passages from the book of James. And I've got a third here that's going to springboard our discussion. Um, in that letter, uh, James begins his letter with this statement. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, because you know 
that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and lacking nothing. Um, this often produces a different perspective around flourishing in the Christian community. Uh, can you mm -hmm. elaborate how, how that uh, impacts your thinking, Karen? Yes, when uh, we talk about trials, we do know life has trials. And an account I thought of um, by uh, Paul, who is in the Bible, um, some, he was in a city and some uh, business people didn't like what he and his friends were doing. So they beat them and threw them in jail. And so they, they were suffering. Uh, potential, you know, really, normally our response in, as people would be to be upset, sad, uh, maybe depressed, uh, maybe however long someone is in jail languishing. Uh, but Paul and his friends had a very different reaction. They ended up praying, talking to God, and singing praise to God's name. And the account in the Bible says the prisoners were listening because that was a very unique response to suffering. And um, again, the response came from people who had this very personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And just knowing God through Jesus caused them to respond to the suffering in a very unique, um, not normal way. Um, and so I just think about the past two years, we've had uh, this COVID, this virus spread throughout the world and it's affected a lot of people and it's caused a lot of suffering. And so I might look at other people who have, again, this very real relationship with God through Christ and look at their response. Some people have had hard times financially, yet I talk with them and they're full of joy. How can you be happy when you're having a financial issue? Well, because they're drawing near to Christ and seeing God's provision in unique ways that they never expected. Um, or, you know, how are, they're having family uh, difficulties, people are stressed. So instead of responding backward, back in stress, they respond in love, uh, they respond in care, uh, they start, you know, supplying needs, maybe physical needs, maybe emotional needs. Uh, maybe uh, mental or spiritual needs, and so they're there for them. And so, so the response uh, to these trials actually ends up showing us that we're flourishing as people, and it's uh, unusual and expected. Thanks, Karen. And Andrew, I'm going to ask you to follow up on this a little bit. I know your book referred to many individuals like Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Carrie Ten Boom, who uh, live very unusual lives. Uh, but also experienced to suffering. And so maybe you could elaborate your thoughts on, on trials, suffering, and challenges in a Christian life. Oh, thank you so much. Um, of course, suffering is not primarily an intellectual problem to be solved. It's primarily a human experience uh, to be lived through and in which we are uh, to support one another. We start the book... Um, with the story of a, uh, of a baby called Angela Ricker, who was born with um, very severe uh, genetic uh, defects, uh, in some ways a bit like Down syndrome, but much, much worse. And <clears throat> we asked the question, you know, how can Angela flourish? Well, the answer is, she, this baby couldn't possibly flourish on her own. And in fact, it, it, by many measures, uh, you might think she never flourished at all until she died in her childhood. But her uncle asks other kinds of questions, like what does it mean for the family to flourish? What does it mean for them to provide an environment that will support the flourishing of this baby? Um, how, how do they flourish? as a result of having that outlet for um, costly love, costly in time and in money. So right from the start, um, we wanted to move away from this individual kind of flourishing, this me, me, me flourishing, you know, how do I do it by myself so that I personally flourish, towards a much more um, 
shared experience and uh, in, in, in suffering, it's got to be a community effort. You know, it, 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 it's not right to suffer alone. And, and this is something where, where we see people suffering, we, we want to reach out, as it were, share their sorrows with them. And, uh, you know, speaking for myself, when I've gone through hard times, I've been so grateful for the individuals and communities who've supported me. Suffering, it, it, the extent to which it's caused by other humans, is a rather subtle thing, isn't it? We can think of lots and lots of suffering that was absolutely directly and in some cases intentionally caused by humans. Uh, earthquakes are a sort of intermediate example. It's often said that uh, people aren't killed by earthquakes, they're killed by buildings in earthquakes. And in many cases, if people had followed the known building codes, far less deaths would have occurred. Uh, we, we, we had a wonderful session this morning on climate change, and it happens that we end the book with an example from climate change. We, we quote Greta Thunberg, but then we move on to Sir John Houghton, who was, um, uh, well, he was an Oxford professor of atmospheric physics, who eventually became highly influential in the intergovernmental panel on climate change. And he, he uh, was someone of Christian faith, and he said, well, his Christian faith and his science always sat quite com comfortably beside each other. But he said it was when he got involved in the IPCC that his faith and his science really uh, became entangled. And if we're going to want to promote other people's flourishing, we're going to need spiritual wisdom to understand sort of why we care about human flourishing and what human flourishing consists of. But time and again, we're also going to need scientific insight because in one way or another, we're likely to be using material ends uh, to seek to alleviate the suffering, whether it's like my colleagues in Oxford, Andy Pollard and Sarah Gilbert, who developed the Oxford corona, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, or all the other ways we can think of that we care for people and want to ameliorate their suffering, chances are at some level we're going to be doing it through material means. That's why the scientific insight and the spiritual wisdom are both going to be needed for promoting human flourishing. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, the culmination of the book speaks about um, actionable love as the fuel for human flourishing. Um, human flourishing is love in action. Um, Karen, could you possibly just share a few words of what you that means to you, actionable oh, love? So actionable love. Uh, we'd have to define love. And many people, well, I would guess movies or music, tends to think it's an emotion. But with love, we've learned emotions can come and go. It's truly a choice. And it's a choice to do an action or do something or listen that is to someone else's benefit. Uh, even if it costs me something, whether it's time or energy or effort or finances, uh, there's going to be a cost. And the, the model for that is Jesus Christ himself, because when he loved us, we didn't love him yet. He loved us first and the cost to him was very high. He came, lived as a man, and died physically uh, in order to save us spiritually. And the cost uh, was ultimate. Yet being God, being powerful, he did conquer death. And so that gives us hope um, for our life, not just here, but when we're all done here. But again, actionable love, it's a, it's a choice, and it takes some effort. Um, it, and so we do want to follow Jesus as that example. Thank you, Anne. Andrew, this is a very important culmination to your book. You want to add a few thoughts on actionable love? Well, I love what, what you've just said, Karen. Um, the, the great um, American speaker and writer, Dale Carnegie, said that whenever he um, uh, got up on a stage to address an audience, 
as he walked on, he tried to do two things. One was uh, to be grateful, and the second one was to love his audience. And uh, if I can adapt that, I think that, that I'm finding increasingly that um, with each encounter, whether it's with an individual or a group or a community, I find myself wanting, first of all, uh, to be grateful for this opportunity to meet these people and be with them. And second, to, to, to say, how, how can I today, in this context, here and now, what can I do to promote their flourishing? Thanks, Andrew. I should mention that if you have questions, uh, you can post them through the uh, Wahova chat. Uh, I should be able to get them up here and uh, be able to finish up fairly quickly. The other thing I should comment on, I know it can be frustrating with the limited amount of time to get the questions answered. I know last year, I'm imposing upon our, our graciousness last year, when there was questions asked that could not be answered within the time, our panelists were gracious enough to spend a little bit of time and, and write answers to those questions. You know, and I think we'd be willing to do that too, Andrew, you know, if we saw your questions. So I wanted to encourage uh, those. Um, okay, we've got a few questions coming through here. Um, I'll try the one at the top here. What specific actions would you encourage politicians and leaders to take to address the problems of income inequality? A small question and short one word answer to hi andrew well my one word <laughs> answer is pay attention in the, this is the uk particularly right <laughs> is pay attention to that first pillar of human flourishing which is uh, the pillar of truthfulness okay what are the uh, can one be wise whilst denying current scientific beliefs that you both can you be why? Well, okay. Science, why is, science, science can have uh, have sort of two meanings. One can be um, as a methodology, a way of finding things out, a way of asking questions, and of using theoretical and experimental tools to address those questions. And another way of thinking about science is as an established body of knowledge. Um, those of us who do professional science, I think, tend to think of it as the first of those. But of course, we, we do the first, drawing on the second. Now, um, in what's technically known as critical realism, we believe that our um, science is describing a reality, but we also recognize that our description is provisional and is liable to be updated if you're professor at Oxford like me, uh, you know, your professional responsibility is to identify good topics for PhD theses that are amenable to advancing knowledge uh, within the space of a three-year PhD. So although, so our knowledge is provisional and, and we understand degrees of scientific uncertainty. And it's precisely because we uh, understand the degrees of uncertainty that we can have appropriate levels of confidence. So for example, I have sufficient confidence in the phase diagrams of aluminum alloys to entrust my life to an airplane to fly over here from the UK. And there are some bits of science that I don't think will ever be over to, I personally, you can discuss this, I don't think the, the second law of thermodynamics will ever be overturned, however much progress we make. Uh, Maxwell's equations, I put pretty close. I think they're going to stand the test of, of, of time for a very long time. But other areas of science, you know, we, we may make adjustments, we may update it, and uh, we'll certainly learn more. Mm -hmm. And just a comment, I think you would concur with this. Some of our greatest scientists challenged the prevailing beliefs at the time and in retrospect were considered wise. This goes all the way back to Copernicus, to uh, Boltzmann, to you know, others that advanced some of the quantum theory 
They I, all I, I played a role in challenging, but adding to the science. I think that's process. right, and they're rightly heroes. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't have such a radical impact on knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, so the, the question is, yeah, uh, and I think it's built into scientists to have a skepticism you know, yeah. which drives us into scientific investigation. I think that's right. The, the cautionary note I'd want to put is that, um, particularly for those who are, uh, don't have the privilege that we have being professionally engaged, the risk is of them saying, oh, well, of course, that's only provisional, that's only what science says at the moment, um, without necessarily having had the opportunity to form a judgment of the appropriate level of confidence in that particular area of science. Mm -hmm. And in most of science, we can ha legitimately have a pretty high level of confidence. Mm -hmm. the, the uncertainty is getting less and less with time. Well, and, and it varies from case to case. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're going to finish with this last question because it's too broad and it'll still help us to con 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 conclude. What are the three biggest takeaways from today's panel? That should be an easy one, right? <laughs> Karen, do you want to say, make a statement on that one? Uh, yeah, I could talk about that. So human flourishing. Yeah, of course, we want to take care of people and love them, uh, take care of their needs. We have basic needs, food, water, shelter. Uh, we've got relational needs. And uh, so taking care of each other, uh, getting to know people, valuing people. We also have a deep-seated need uh, for a relationship with God. And so if we get to the point with someone where we can share that and just have a discussion, um, I'll just love the person and allow them to think about it. And to seek God for themselves, but to be there to answer questions. Andrew, do you want to wrap up further? Well, I, I think I think this is a question for you, actually, Mike. Oh, do you, do you pass I, that along? I, 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 Three I mean, the, yeah. Well, the, I, I've got that. I'm going to amplify the, what what Karen said. I really did appreciate what you also said. To human flourishing is a collective activity. It's not a necessarily a personal activity. Uh, and, and that uh, we're placed into a body, and whether we're Christians, sometimes we're placed in the body of Christ, but even then we're encouraged to love one another, you know, uh, support one another, and even the uh, key, what I call the, the commandment of uh, compassion, uh, Matthew 25, where Christ basically tells us to take care of the widow, the orphan, the, those imprisoned, you know, and, and encourages that. And, and so we have a particular perspective on flourishing that's interactive. And then I like what you said, it's actionable love, Andrew, <laughs> you know, that, that culminates in the, in the book. And then the transcendent, I'm going to offer the end. We began, John Luke prayed, he's in James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. So that's the transcendent part that we need in, in the end. For us to flourish, we cannot do it in human wisdom alone, scientific wisdom alone. It's not going to be sufficient. It's that uh, embracing our need as creatures to rely upon the Creator. So that should finish us up. Thank you. Thank you.